you very much. Um, great pleasure to be here today. Um, the takeover of Hidden Charms 2 by the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic continues. Uh, it's been mentioned three times, though, which is great. Um, I'm going to talk about the Witch Bottle Collection at the Museum. Uh, we've got at least 11, um, and we had, I think, a lot more. Um, a lot of archival material has turned up uh, where the founder, Cecil Williamson, writes about um, bottles that he used to display in the museum. Um, we don't know where they are now. Um, so I'm going to sort of, you'll see occasionally these little cards with sort of typewritten text on, and that's his interpretation card. So if you see those, that's what's going on. But I'll, I'll, you'll see this go through. Um, I just want to begin by sort of recapping, if possible, the sort of basics uh, of which bottle um, culture you like. Um, they largely, the physical examples largely date from the 17th century onwards. And as I'm sure you're all aware, this sort of broadly, this bellamine type in that period, um, have a tribe of core ingredients, pins, salt, and urine. Um, hair often crops up as well. Um, and they're a counter magical device. So they are, um, the purpose of them is to break the power of the witch over um, their victim. And um, we know this because there's two great uh, 17th century sources that sort of detail, um, give a lot of detail about how the, these were used. I'm not going to go into all this because uh, I'm talking about later examples. Um, generally speaking, I think we can say that they're the products of sort of magical specialists or professionals in the field, so cunning folk, cunning person, wise women, um, or some sort of astrological physical specialist. Um, because this is sort of bound up into the sort of semi-scientific worldview of the period. Um, I think this is important, although it is debated. Um, the witch bottle was broadly coherent with contemporary scientific assumptions, if we can talk about science in this period. The 17th century is a mashup of lots of different and interesting and often contradictory ideas. I think it's a fabulous period. Um, but is it folk magic? Is it science? Is it medicine? These are all up for debate. But when we look at the, the, the examples from later periods, I think it's uncontestably folk magic. It has a different rationale, or a non-rationale, and we'll talk about it. So um, I always do this for myself, to keep myself on task. Um, I want to talk about witch bottles from about 1850 to 1950 that, that are in our collection. That date range broadly represents the kind of strength of the collection that we have, and that was collected by Cecil Williamson. Um, that the, the objects date from that sort of roughly that period, but also slightly later. I also like to suggest new interpretations and definitions of witch bottles for this period, and I want to really immerse you, the audience, in ideas and examples collected by Cecil Williamson, and convince you that he's a really, really important figure in 20th century folklore, collecting, magic, etc. Oh yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and visit. So, uh, what is a witch bottle? Um, well, this is Cecil Williamson's definition of it. And I just want to sort of um, point you towards that sort of first phrase, to capture and enclose a spirit essence, um, together with part of one's victim. So, you know, just think about that a little bit. And also ways in which they're used, uh, casting them in rivers, hiding them, heating them up, putting them in ponds, lakes, wells, throwing them in the sea, uh, burning them, boiling them, smashing them, or just leave them to stand in the road for other people to take away. So there's a nice broad overview. Um, that's a sort of handmade sketch that Cecil did of his witch bottle display from the 1970s, when he actually started collecting witch bottles in the 1940s, if not before. So he's quite ahead of the curve, really, in terms of this material culture. Um, just briefly, this is my definition really. In the 19th and 20th century, which bottles are a product of a fluid, results-based economy of magic? So if it doesn't work, then the cunning person that you're consulting is going to lose their reputation quite quickly. So um, it's a transactional economy. Um, and the production of use of which bottles is individualistic. I think this is really important. And it draws upon private, symbolic, and magical ideas. 
Um, but we can access these things using kind of folkloric research, what something might mean in one region or another region, and we can kind of hopefully make sense, or we're going to try and make sense of this stuff. And um, going on from Cecil's idea, a witch bottle contains some form of spirit essence, captured, conjured, or coerced into a bottle. It interacts with the contents of that bottle in a magical, symbolic way, which is imagined by the community in which it's used, yeah. by the coming mm -hmm. person, or the, the maker of the bottle. And location is vitally important to determine what that bottle's function was, what's its meaning. Okay, so let's move on to some, got some general themes that I want to talk about. Um, this source, uh, I think, is one of the most important sources to understanding which bottles in the modern period. Um, I've got it from the Wells Journal. Has been discussed sort of a little bit by Owen Davies, um, but I'm going to talk about an element of it which he hasn't really talked about. Um, in Stockport, or a place called Edgeley, just outside of Stockport, two glass bottles with pins, urine, and dragon's blood, which is kind of plant resin, were discovered in a roadway. Um, this is a brilliant source because there was a journalist there, and um, a kind of crowd gathered around these, uh, this sort of excavation of these bottles, and everyone started talking about what they thought what th th these bottles meant. And this journalist was on the spot, and he started writing these ideas down. Um, so there's, there's one thing um, which he observed initially, which is that several in the crowd thought that these were love charms. So made by fortune tellers to sort of keep your man in line sort of thing. And then the other witnesses came forward and claimed that bottles, witch bottles, pins, um, urine, etc., were devices made by witches. They were, they were a kind of witchcraft. And they had a malefic intent. Um, and they also said if you found one of these, then you should ultimately, the first thing you should do is go to a wise woman to, to sort the problem out. So this journalist sought out a professional in the field, uh, a professional Polish fortune teller and planet ruler, was the way he described her, and she said, absolutely must dispose of the bottle in, in, in the proper way. So what is the proper way to dispose of a witch bottle? Well, um, you can't just break it. If you break it, all sorts of bad stuff will happen. The land will be poisoned. The vegetation will die. Um, and that's particularly if you throw it into a cesspool. You're know, very, very clear about this. Don't throw it in a cesspool or a rubbish pit. Just don't do it. The only, the only way to do it was to break the fire over a running stream, whereby uh, the pernicious fluid would mingle with the pure current and be imperceptibly but irrevocably wasted, the bottle being also cast into the river. Okay? Then there's another story about which bottle in this source. Um, we'll go back to this in a bit, but the informant's sister was once bewitched by a witch bottle. Okay, so this isn't a counter magical charm, it's a means of affecting a curse on somebody. They knew that the offending bottle was buried in the bed of the river Mersey underneath the Wellington Bridge Arch. And this caused all kinds of problems, but we'll come back to that one. I just want to consider a kind of bottle that would be buried in a kind of water-based environment. Now this one, um, in the museum collection, um, is a, as you can see, a kind of torpedo shape, roughly sort of mid-19th century, 20th, uh, early 20th century, probably deposited in that period, might have been a bit later, we're not exactly sure. Um, inside this, um, this top actually just came off recently. Uh, it wiggled itself free. I, I didn't do anything to it, honestly. <laughs> uh, and it came off, and this is really bad photo, but you can't really see it. But inside of there is a, a massive kind of weeping willow leaves. Uh, one bent pin, and there might be more pins in there. Definitely can see one bent pin. You can't see it on there, but trust me. And there was a mat of twisted hair, black hair in that as well. This sort of, uh, that thing falling down there, that's the hair that's kind of going back into the mud in the base end of the bottle. Anyway, that's what it is. 
This is the interpretation that I've recently found um, regarding this bottle. And it was discovered in, uh, in the dried sludge of an old disused cesspit at the manor house <coughs> of Sevenix, which is presumably known. Um, Ill wishing magic is indicated by various aspects of the bottle's uh, shape and contents, as well as the spot chosen for its deposit. So, this is really <coughs> interesting because Cecil Williamson is kind of in tune. I mean, I don't <coughs> think you read that Stockport source. That Stockport source is really interesting because it's suggesting this ill wishing nature of witch bottles, which is quite a new, is it relatively new idea. I think it's probably <coughs> Brian will correct me in the <coughs> Um, it also has um, this sort of mark on it, which is quite interesting with regard to witch bottles generally, which are thought to have a kind of animus about them if they have a bearded face or some sort of uh, anthropomorphic element to them. And this has a kind of mermaid on it, which again links the watery aspect. Um, <coughs> so that's just a sort of side, side thing. Another bottle, um, this one, um, more or less the same date period, contains chicken feathers bound up in red wax. Um, and this was deposited in south flowing water in the River Tresillian in Cornwall. Um, a charm against being bewitched. This is a general card about this. Um, putting lots of bits and bobs in a jar, casting the watertight jar into a south flowing stream to be carried away. So evil, evil energies are put in a jar, thrown in a south flowing river to take this malefic energy away from you. So, um, so far, a kind of analysis of these sort of two sources bouncing off each other. If breaking a witch bottle into pure flowing water diffuses the bottle, um, and that's a form of a sort of beneficent ritual disposal that a cunning person would do for you. Um, maybe if we're finding bottles in an archaeological context which is stagnant standing water, maybe that suggests something different, like a different use of um, the bottle, a different intention behind it. Um, as we've said, it carries influences away, south flow water. Interesting to think about whether this bottle has been diffused in any way, whether its contents are a form of, sort of contagion magic, is this kind of a pestilence from a chicken feather that's been put in water in order to take away that evil influence. Not quite sure. But we know <coughs> from this that river locations are, are really sort of magically efficacious. This was brought home to me actually quite recently. Um, I did a talk in Bodmin, and afterwards this chap came up to me and he said, I, I, I knew a, a charmer in Blisland, um, and he could cure ringworm, but he could only do it um, in a nine mile stretch in between the River Camel and um, the River Delank, the Delank River, which is sort of a tributary of the thing. It's a nine mile stretch of land, and he couldn't charm anywhere else. He could only do it in that, that boundary between two rivers. Um, so he gets this, this idea of the importance of, of, of rivers and their sort of energy flow through the land in the southwest. And places for spirit contact deposition, putting the bottle into the spirit world. Quite an interesting idea. Let's go back to the Stockport source to sort of re-emphasise that a little bit. So, as you remember, this poor woman was bewitched by a witch bottle, and the, the witch deposited the bottle in the River Mersey. She went to a wise woman. The bewitched woman was called upon to stand in a particular spot at a given time while an incantation was pronounced. Several spirits passed before her, one of which remained in front of her for some time. To this spirit, the planet ruler, the wise woman, addressed herself, and it soon disappeared together with the young woman's ailments and forebodings. <coughs> Just a, a wonderful evocation of what's going on with the bottles <coughs> in sort of waterbound locations. And it just makes me think, well, what's in this bottle? What's the kind of social relationship going on here, you know? Um, someone believes there is, that they are bewitched by a bottle that's in the River Mersey. What is the sort of process of this curse being enacted upon them? Surely an element of this is that the person trying to curse the individual says, look at this bottle, I've got a part of your essence in here, and I'm going to sort of doubly imprison it 
in a bottle and then in the bottom of a river. And you can imagine the kind of psychological trauma that would cause to someone. And I think, you know, this is, you know, it's reinforced time and time again as a co cultural histories of witchcraft, that, that this, this fear of witchcraft is so intense in the modern period. And this doesn't always surface in the sources that, but I think it sort of comes out here. So, if a witch, according to this source, can seal the spirit essence of a victim in a bottle, then of course, there must be some kind of reciprocal thing going on. Now, spirit traps are something that Brian's kind of alluded to in your work. Um, and I think it, you know, it's a theory that's really, really important. Um, this is probably, are you familiar with this one? Yeah. yeah. Um, brilliant thing. Uh, it's in the Pit Rivers. Witch in a Bottle. Um, from Sussex, collected in 1915, donated to the Pit Rivers Museum by Mark Murray. So, you know, that might be a black mark against it for some of you, I don't know. Um, but anyway, <laughs> they do say there'd be a witch in the bottle. And if you let them out, there'll be a peck of trouble. This is the story collected in this bottle. So, is this, this idea of a witch in the bottle? We come from like, you know, the 16th, 17th century, where witch bottles are these kind of magical counter devices, to the beginning of the 20th century, where witches are in bottles all of a sudden. You know, what's going on? Well, this is a bottle in the museum's collection that um, we sort of didn't know anything about. And I, I opened it up because I was just interested. With, with the uh, permission of the director of the museum, on my ad. And it contains some interesting stuff. Six snail shells, lots of desiccated matter, uh, a beetle or a fly with droppings, two um, lower arm bits from a really large beetle, which is that, which I've identified as the cockchafer beetle, which is huge. I've got a picture of one in a minute. Um, and a small segmented leg of, of some of the kind of beetle. This is the only information we've got with this. It's a small interpretation card written by Cecil Williamson. Um, cards like this are usually records of conversations that he's had with people. Um, ginger beer bottle with a ball stopper. Spirit prison buried upside down, black beetle entombed. Um, this is probably, he, he was probably given this by someone out in the West Country somewhere. And he thought, oh great, another bottle, or whatever. And then just wrote this down, accompanying the accompanying story with it. So, there is a kind of a, an end point to this, so don't worry. Beetles in bottles, and this is actually a quite a traditional, I mean, if you're just looking at the contents, um, snails, beetles, it's actually known as a charm for whooping cough in Ireland. But I, I think there's something more to this. I mean, uh, we know, of course, that witches were known or believed to have um, taken the form of animals and insects. There's quite a lot of witch bottles out there in the archaeological record that have insects in them. Um, some particular insects are perceived to be agents of evil and familiars of the witch. And just by happenstance, the cockchafer beetle has a slang kitty witch or billy witch um, uh, folklore attached to it. Now, there's, I think this, this is an interesting line of inquiry. I don't have all the, I don't have answers here. I'm just sort of putting things out. If you think about it, after 1736, when witchcraft no longer becomes a prosecutable offence in this country, um, in fact, the people who are um, always scratching witches as recourse against witchcraft are, are find themselves in the dock. Um, there has to be a change of practice somewhere along the line. So you have in Devon toad fairs where cunning men would take toads and rip them apart and give them out as charms. You've also got another a ritual called lifting the witch. Has anyone heard of that one? Where you put a toad, which is, symbolises the witch, on a kind of seesaw and you smack the seesaw and the toad is flung <laughs> out of the parish or out of the boundary of particular community, and it's this kind of like ridding yourself of a witch, right? So there's this idea in a kind of folk consciousness that 
Um, rather than harming the body of a perceived mal, mal, you know, practice of malficium, you have to kind of do it by proxy. So this is maybe where things like this cockchafer beetle, which is massive, you can see, it's five seconds long, UK roving beetle, may come in. A kind of coping strategy, you know, persecuting something that you can get away with persecuting. I just want to throw this one in because it mentions another uh, beetle in here. We don't have this bottle anymore, I don't think. I haven't discovered it yet. But it was taken from a crossroads, and the wise one who put it there, so this is probably some sort of apotropaic charm, charm against witchcraft, possibly, um, had black chicken's heart, blood, three black devil's coachman's beetles, black horse hair, lamb's wool, material, blah, blah, blah. So it's just interesting to think, I mean, these, rather than pins, maybe beetles have a different role to play in witch bottles. Now this beetle is a roving beetle which is carnivorous and what it does, the folklore behind it is known as a sin or a coffin cutter which means it goes to people who are particularly sinful in their coffins and eats them. It also has a folklore of cursing because it lifts up its tail like this and spits a kind of disgusting acidic substance at you and in the past people thought that this was some sort of um, agent of the witch or agent of the devil. It's also got a lot of devil lore associated with it. If you've made a pact with the devil, you, you will automatically find one of these beetles in the palm of your hand and you know you've got the kind of mark of Cain sort of. So this is all from sort of English countryside lore. So the idea really is that bottles become prisons and traps for the witch's spirit familiar, animal insect form, but they can also as double uh, as healing and protective charms. There's really important sort of slippage of usage here. And this is a bottle in the, in the collection uh, for the protection of cider orchards um, in the Ottery St. Mary area of Devon. And it, the principle really is that there's a beneficent spirit of cider in there, corked up with these sort of uh, wasp gall uh, apples on the top there. And almost certainly that there's a, there's, a, there's a wasp in there too. So a kind of protective charm, killing off the wasp that's going to eat your blossoms and stuff, it's going to be in there. Uh, but Cecil's in, interpreted this as, as it's a protective charm that can burst forth if ever your old chicken are in trouble. Um, just widening it out to, to other things in the collection, spirit bottles, the idea that everybody has unwanted spirits hanging around the place and that you can house them in jars like this. Very interesting idea. And this kind of segues into more sort of medical healing and protection, the use of jars and this sense. I just want to mention this one because it's got, uh, or obviously a mouse in there, packed with salt. And this idea of a protective charm which also doubles as a medical thing. So in folk medicine it's well known, well known use, um, to put salt in with particularly insects, but also sort of little mammals, to render the fat down. You leave the jar in the sun, <laughs> and then you can use that fat in various unguents and, uh, and ointments later on, usually for sort of beneficent healing purposes. But it also doubles as this kind of sacrificial thing too. The suffering of a mouse as a warning against other mice for an infestation in the building. Bottles and healing. This is an interesting one, because West Country, there's a whole folklore of stroking and striking an afflicted part of the body. Got lots of different examples in the museum, leather strokers, uh, a, a lead brass, uh, a leaden breast, which is from wells, which was used to um, encourage breastfeeding of the flow of milk and stroking stones. But Williamson also writes that he has found charm-filled bottles that were used to rub people's bad backs as a kind of stroking magic. And he also says that these were house charms consisting of bottles placed under ridge roof tiles which also contained coins. Now these are lots of ideas out here, I'm just sort of throwing them at you. There's a well-known tradition also in almost sort of every part of the UK of hag pennies, healing coins. You have a special coin, usually that's harnessing the power of the moon. It has a sort of picture of a, um, a goddess on it, Providentia sometimes, like these coins here. Uh, these coins were used by a charmer called Charlie Wallace uh, near Carlisle. 
he would drop them in water, in the light of the moon's rays, he would charm the water and then use these, uh, the water in various charms. So is, you know, is that why coins are in bottles? And is that why they are used in protective charms? Because they have a healing quality that can also transfer to the protective, uh, protection of the building. This might be one example of that happening. This is my last object. Right. Um, this is a melted bottle recovered from the pub in Mormonstone, which is on the sort of Cornwall Devon border, Mormon border. Um, and you can see there, it's got a sort of a semi-melted brass coin and a, and a semi-bent melted pin. Now this was taken out of a thatch fire that happened in 1968. There's newspaper reports about it. And it just, it just sort of got my imagination going about this idea of country, this, this sort of West Country idea that bottles contain spirit essences. And this could be a straightforward healing bottle, could have been used as a rub on someone's back, and then if you see a beneficent thing that you then put in the, in the, uh, in the thatch. It could also be maybe some sort of spirit container. And it's interesting, a piece of folklore that comes with it, um, that when the fire was happening, um, people reportedly saw uh, figures dancing in the flames, that this sort of spirit had been loosed from this bottle. And there were lots of interest in this bottle, and it's sort of which is quite interesting. Um, that's the Bournemouth pub, which is a cracking pub, by the way. So, so there's a lot of ideas there, and I'm sorry if it's a bit confused, but I think based on the evidence from this later period, I think there's enough to suggest that witch bottles can be broadened out, maybe. You've seen the malefic use of them. Um, when you, this always happens when you, when you study, and Cheryl said this earlier, when you study material culture, it leads you in new directions. Like, you know, it's very easy to get sort of stuck in the black grave, Joseph Glanville, 16th, 17th century sources of what a witch bottle is. And they're very, very helpful, I'm not knocking it at all. But the material culture does take you in new directions. Um, much more to be done on this collection. I mean, you know, I just chanced to open one of these bottles and, and, and it'd be great if we could scan more of them. But I think my research has also suggested that much more active archaeology is needed in this area. Now, in Cornwall, of course, you find a lot of bottles buried under wayside crosses at crossroads. So it would be fantastic to have some sort of archaeological project where we actually sort of dig, you know, dig up these areas to try and find more things. Riverbank, archaeology of riverbanks and riverbeds too could be really, really interesting. Um, in terms of interpretations, there's, there's a definite gap here, I think, in terms of what folklore can do for us. We talked about the Beatles in a bottle as being a, a, an Irish charm. But maybe in England it's completely different. So it'd be great to have some sort of folklore index which we can apply to archaeological finds. Um, something of the type has been suggested by Amy Gazel Schwartz a long time ago. It'd be great to sort of get that up and go, yeah, for sure. Nearly there. And again, I hope that this sort of talk, um, throwing all these examples at you, has just sort of made you realise um, how significant the museum's collection is. Particularly the archival material, which we're digging up all the time, but something like 10,000 documents relating to southwest charmers, charming and witchcraft. And so that's it, the Whistle we'll Stop Tour of Witch Bottles. I didn't even get time to talk about fart bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Maybe next time. Okay, thank you very much.